from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Before women had uh, enormous opportunities, before they won the opportunities they have now in the workplace, in society, in politics. And I can't imagine they'd be able to dream up a character or a career like the one Catherine Neville has enjoyed. Uh, she's been both a uh, computer executive, uh, an oil executive, a, a Bank of America vice president. Uh, she's been a professional model, uh, a professional photographer, a painter. Uh, that kind of character only exists in the pages of novels ba back in the day. And now that she writes novels of her own, the life that she and her husband Carl have built have made her a fantasy figure for myself. They have houses in D.C., down the road in Virginia, and out in Santa Fe. But most of all, she has a community of readers that we welcome a lot of you today, and I introduce to you Catherine Neville. Make, make sure everybody can hear me. Can you all hear me? Okay, just wave a hand if you can't hear me. Um, I am so jazzed to be here today. I live in Washington, D.C., and I have never, ever been invited to the National Book Festival. And I showed up, and uh, I'm really happy to, to have been invited when we had a president that I absolutely, I, I said I was going to vote for Barack Obama before he knew he was going to run for president. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's, it's great. And uh, we, all the authors were talking about that last night. Um, I, for those who have not read any of my books, and I'm sure there are quite a few here who haven't, uh, let me just say a little bit, because I, I have to tag off of what Jody Picot said um, about school. When I was in school, and one of the reasons I had so many jobs, by the way, is not that I was so creative about finding jobs. It was because I kept getting fired or laid off. <laughs> when, I, when I got out of college, um, with a degree in business and a degree in English, there were no jobs for a woman unless she could type. And I couldn't type. I still can't type. You know, I write my books like this with one hand. Um, so I had to take any job that I could possibly find. And he left out, Ned left out a few things like waiter and busboy <laughs> that were part of my career. Uh, and what happened was there was this brand new industry starting up called uh, data processing. And I had never heard of it. I thought uh, IBM was a clock, because that's what it said on the wall. Uh, the clocks all said IBM, and Honeywell was a thermostat. And um, I, I, it turned out that I tested the highest uh, of almost anybody in the country on aptitude for computers. So they all trained me. I went to work in data processing, and that took me all over the world. Uh, because every time I get fired or laid off, I have my resume someplace else. And it ended up that um, I had a job one day in the Midwest somewhere for one of those big CPA firms of the kind that have just been involved in all the scandals lately. And um, I was a little uh, depressed by uh, what was going on in my company, and I was about to quit. And so the senior partner called me in one day, and he said, um, Catherine, uh, I want to talk to you. And I said, well, I want to talk to you about something, too. So he says, meet me in my office at 3 p.m. And so I went at 3 p.m. And for some odd reason, this is serendipity for you, I said, you go first. And he said, we have a new project starting up in Algiers. And I said, I'll go. <laughs> he said, do you know where Algiers is? I said, no, but I'll find it on a map. <laughs> so I ended up actually going in 1972 to Algeria on the coast of North Africa. Uh, and about six or eight months after I got there, uh, this little-known boys' club called OPEC decided to declare a world embargo on oil, and I was right there working for them. So that became the inspiration for my first book, The Eight. I, I should say, like Jody, I've been writing books since uh, novels since I was eight years old. I mean, almost every author, if you ask them, when did you really start wanting to be a writer, start writing, it's usually around eight or ten years old. Well, the boys kick in about 14 or 15, but, you know, <laughs> the girls, girls start earlier. Um, so anyway, I got the idea to write this book, and for those who haven't read the book, um, it is set during the OPEC embar embargo, but... It's about a fabulous gold and silver bejeweled chess set that once belonged to Charlemagne. And at the beginning of the book, it's been buried for a thousand years. And it's dug up during the French Revolution by this bunch of nuns because soldiers are looting the abbeys and monasteries. And it's scattered all over the world. And from that point in the 1790s during the French Revolution till the 1970s during the OPEC 
embargo, everybody's chasing around trying to find this chess set, and the entire book is a huge chess game with 32 historic characters and 32 modern characters, and it's got puzzles and tales within a tale and a uh, very complex plot. So obviously when I finished writing this book, while I was working at the Bank of America in San Francisco, I finished it, and um, I thought no publisher in the world is ever going to buy a book like this because it was so different from everything. I thought they'd look at the book and say, what is this, a map of intergalactic relationships in the universe or something? You know, this is not a novel, is it? Um, well, as it turns out, uh, it was bought uh, 20 years ago, uh, as of last year, 20 years ago, by Ballantine Books, which is part of Random House. And that book is now in 40 languages. Uh, it's been a bestseller in all 40 languages. I mean, I think we recently Bulgarian, Latvian, and so forth. And, and the book was voted a few years ago in a national poll by El País, the big Spanish newspaper, was voted uh, one of the top 10 books of all time. So it's been, uh, I, in fact, I just got back from Spanish book tour in January, and we, they had bongo drums out in the streets for my book signings. They, they brought in the Spanish national chess champion to play a game of chess on this giant chess board with me. They don't even call me Catherine, they call me El Ocho. <laughs> El Ocho, will you sign my book? <laughs> So, uh, but it's, it's been just a fabulous uh, roller coaster ride, but when the, when the book first came out 20 years ago, it was true. Everything that I feared was true. People didn't know what to call it. They were calling me um, the female Umberto Eco, uh, the female Alexander Dumas, the female Charles Dickens, um, the female Steven Spielberg. It was, a, a, a Washington Post said, a feminist answer to Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> uh, and, and they didn't know where to review it. You know, it was reviewed in Locus magazine uh, as science fiction. Uh, it received the Romantic Times Best Historical Mystery uh, Award, you know. It went on like this. And um, I feel that in a way, I mean, it's really nice to have a genre to write in, but when I was coming here today, John Colt, they were trying to figure out at the festival what tent to put me in. <laughs> Where should we stick her? Uh, so I think that the, the really fascinating thing about What's happened with the book is, now I've written the sequel. I have had two books in the middle, and I've written the sequel to the eight, The Fire, which is set 30 years later. It's set in Washington, D.C. Uh, the modern part is set in Washington, D.C. The book starts at the dawn of the War of Green Greek Independence uh, in Albania, and with Ali Pasha and Lord Byron, and you know, they're all swashbuckling adventure novels. And, when I went out on book tour with this book, uh, and the modern part is set, I should say, in the, in the very week that the war in, uh, that we entered Iraq during the, during the war. So, and, and it's in Washington, D.C., and the heroine is the daughter of two of the previous characters. So it was hard for me to write, uh, to write a book set in Washington, D.C., because right after um, I'd started the book the first time, the... Uh, uh, a, a little known author named Dan something or other said he was going to set his next book in Washington. I can't remember his name. Uh, he was going to set his next book in D.C. And I thought, oh my gosh, and everybody knows that I always have Freemasons and mystery and symbolism and stuff. Well, luckily for me, even though no one knew the name of the, the, the category to put my book in, I knew what my book was actually, what, <clears throat> what category it was. It actually is the oldest form of literature I had to say this going all along on um, book tour that, was, that we have in print. It's called a quest novel. And, you know, we have, you know, uh, uh, Parsifal looking for the, uh, seeking the Holy Grail and, and uh, 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 you know, Jason and the Golden Fleece and um, Odysseus and Dorothy of Oz, both, both looking for home in different ways. And uh, so I went out talking about the fact that I was writing a quest novel, and the oldest quest novel that we have was written in Baghdad, well, before Baghdad existed, but in Sumer, and it's called the Gilgamesh. It's the story of the king of, of Sumer, and uh, all these adventures he goes out on, and then finally he goes questing. When his great friend Enkidu dies, he goes questing after the elixir of life. You know, this is what all my books are about. Well, now, in the 20 years that have passed, a lot of people have written quest novels, including the Dan guy. <laughs> and uh, so I was, uh, I was absolutely flabbergasted because I went out 
on tour, and people were asking me that, about this, and I was talking about the importance of quest novels and how we really need to feel not just so depressed about everything that's going on in the world. We can get depressed by reading the newspaper or watching TV or just walking down the street, but we really need some kind of inspiration of what can we do about it, you know? I mean, what did other people do about it when times were really bad? And um, so anyway, I went out on tour, and people started coming to me and saying, look at this review of your book. It says, you invented this genre <laughs> that, it, you know, Dan Brown stands on the shoulders of a giant and all this, come up. this that would be pretty heavy for me. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, it's been so fantastic for me to see that, that people have opened up to accept this, what, what really was one of the oldest, ages old, uh, uh, forms of literature in the world, and that all of a sudden it's re resurfaced and revitalized, not just thanks to me, but thanks to a lot of the people that are writing about it. Um, anyway, let me tell you a little about the new one, and then let me open this for questions, because I see a lot of people out there I know, and I know they have questions. Um, the new book, The Fire, it's set, as I said, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Washington, D.C., in the very week that we went into Iraq, but I didn't know that was the week when I was writing the book. I didn't know that's what happened. I had started the book. I had thought up the idea for the book in 1992 when I was on a train from Switzerland to Prague. And I was, I'd just been injured the day, the afternoon before. I'd fallen down a flight of steps in the dark in, uh, uh, on Lago Maggiore in this bright, brightly lit restaurant outside. And uh, I'd gone into the back looking for the powder room. And they had those those dimmer, those lights that turn themselves off to save energy, no lights, so I thought I was going down a hallway and I just went whoom, out into the air and I was going head first down this stairwell. And so I'd injured myself and I was sort of bruised and everything, so I'm walking up and down on the train for 16 hours from Switzerland to Prague and I came up with the idea how to write the sequel to The Eight, that it would be set years later that the, uh, the characters' um, children would be the protagonists in the historic part and in the modern part. And so I had the idea and I started writing the book, but each time I tried to write it, something would happen that would prevent me from writing it. And the most recent thing that happened was a plane flew into the Pentagon right across the river from my apartment in Washington, D.C. And I, I mean, Carla and I had just heard um, we had just been at the travel agents. We were supposed to go to Spain the next day. And we just heard, a plane has flown into the uh, uh, World Trade Center. And our, our travel agent turned on the TV and said, look, there it is, an instant replay. The plane is flying right into the building. You can see it hitting the building. And the voiceover said, and I said, what's that plume of smoke coming out of the other building over there? And the voiceover said, a second plane has just hit the second tower. So all the phones were jammed, everybody, you know, we didn't know if we were going to Spain or if the airports would be open. So we went back home about five blocks in our little town in Virginia, walked in the front door, we had the radio on for our little bird, Tootie, who liked to listen to classical music all day. And uh, they said, we interrupt this classical music program to say that a third plane has just hit the Pentagon. And I said to Carl, I mean, the first thing out of our mouth was, are we at war with somebody? The second thing, out of my mouth was, I'm not writing the book that I thought I was writing, I was supposed to be writing. My book literally, you know, you can't write the sequel to a book about OPEC and oil and the Middle East and Islam and all this. Uh, if it's happening around you, you're like in the eye of the tornado and you, you can see what's happening sort of, but you don't know the big picture from outside. So I waited, I waited, and when I started writing the book, I decided to set it in this particular uh, week in 2003, and I did, and I was more than halfway through the book. I had a deadline. The book was supposed to be published last October, and it was, but I got a, uh, an email from someone, and he said, Miss um, Neville, I admire your book so much. Um, I read The Eight when I was over in Kuwait. You know, I get a lot of letters from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, armed service people, and he said, uh, and it inspired me so much to learn to play chess, you know. Uh, I, I knew how to play chess, but it inspired me to master chess, and I went, you know, uh, to study with chess masters, and I really have become a good chess player, and I would like to meet you. I'd like, I found out you live in D.C. I'd like to host you uh, to come down for lunch or dinner and a private tour of the bunkers underneath um, down here at U.S. Treasury. 
and it's signed Chief of Staff of the United States Treasury. <laughs> so I'm going, right, this is an email, right? <laughs> I spent 22 years in data processing security, you know, and some lady said, while well, I was on Bookter, said, and all you have to do is send your bank account number in and you, you too may restore a Nigerian prince to his rightful throne. <laughs> So I wrote this really polite letter and said, thank you very much. You know, that's very, um, uh, I, it's wonderful that you love my book. I'm not writing about finance right now. That was another book of mine. But, you know, I'll come down sometime. And then three months later, I get this message. I'm still under deadline. It says, so when can we set up that lunch down here at Treasury? <laughs> so I, by then I'd looked him up. He really was the, the chief of staff of the, the, the youngest chief of staff that they had had under Secretary Paulson. And so, um, as ch chance will have it, I had been invited to, to um, speak at Thriller Fest in New York, the International Thriller Writers, on a panel of people about financial thrillers. So I said, well, maybe I'll come down. And so I called his assistant and said, okay, can you set up the lunch? And she said, fine, all we'll need is your social security number. <laughs> The Secret Service has to have your social security. I guess they need to see if you've paid your taxes before they let you into Treasury. <laughs> so uh, I did go down, and the end of this story is, which was really astonishing, and this is, I, I heard somebody ask Jody about how do you write, you know, what, what is your inspiration type of thing. This is it. This is the serendipity, we call it serendipity uh, writing on the wall, you know. And I really think it's the most important thing to be able to listen to this kind of thing when it happens. We're sitting there. I saw Secretary Paulson's office. I met a lot of people at Treasury. We, I found out. I saw the secret bunkers. And we're sitting there after lunch overlooking the gardens outside Treasury. And I said to him, we're all alone, the chief and I. And I said to him, how, how was it that you happened to um, be over in Kuwait? What, you know, what were you doing there? And, and learn to master chess over there. And he said, oh, no, no. I read your book while I was in Kuwait. But I actually learned to master chess um, in, in Baghdad. I was the second person into Baghdad. I said, who was the first person into Baghdad? He said, my boss, Tommy Franks. <laughs> I said, how, you know, he seemed kind of young, you know, how did you happen to be working for Tommy Franks? He said, oh no, I was just loaned uh, to him by my real boss, Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> so it turns out he had been an assistant to Condoleezza Rice. It was great. And I said, I just sat there and I said, you know, I realize now I wasn't down here to find out about Treasury. I was down here to find out about Baghdad. I mean, it just clicked. That was the week, the week I was writing about. That's what we did. What was the big event that week? So I went back and I called up, I called up my, um, my editor and said, my book is going to be a little bit late. Guess what just, just dropped into the plot? <laughs> And uh, so we did. We, we revised the direction that it was going so that we could put in the connection because, and I said this to the chief while I was down at the Treasury, I said, you know, this is so weird because at the very end of the eight, when, when the whole story ends of the chess game and everything, we find out that the chess set, that we always refer to it as the chess set that belonged to Charlemagne, we find out that actually it was designed by a, a real person, uh, Al Jabir Ibn Hayyan, in 775 AD in what was then the brand new city of Baghdad. Baghdad had just been invented in seven, 765 or something. And that was a real living person. I invented the chess set, but he was a real uh, person. And he was the father of Islamic alchemy. So the whole book is about alchemy. And uh, I said, you know, it's so weird because you know, Baghdad, the modern part of the book is set, and it's, my book want, didn't want me to find out about treasury. It wanted me to come down here and find out about Baghdad. And the chief said, I know. I thought that's why you'd really want to talk to me. <laughs> so he did a huge amount of research for me because he'd actually been on the ground. And, and, you know, the hands of Saddam Hussein holding the swords up and this kind of thing. And it was extremely... Um, I say at the very, this is, The Fire is the only book I've ever written where I have a huge acknowledgement section at the back, and I didn't acknowledge people like, thanks to my husband, thanks to my dog, thanks to, you know, people I've worked with, uh, thanks to my publisher. It's all thanks for people who actually like that did research for me. Uh, just because they were on the ground, they knew, they, were, they loved what they're doing, and I had so many of them that I had to do it by topic. I have like uh, Albania aviation. <laughs> uh, and I have really incredible people 
who, who were able to, to sort of um, um, further the book. And so I say in the book, it's like that fairy tale when you know you're walking along the road and you, the, you know, so people are always kicking this rock. It's in the middle of the road. Why is that rock in the middle of the road? And they kick it out of the way. And, uh, but always the, some boy comes along and he picks up the rock and says someone might get hurt. And when he moves it, he finds a pot of gold under there or he finds uh, a map to the pot of gold or the map to some other treasure. And I think that's the secret for writers, that really, if you're going to write a book that is really realistic to people, you have to be able to, you know, pick up, pick up the rock and go for the pot of gold. So anyway, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. And we have a question period, I think, right now. We have a question? Uh, yes. Um, I, um, I, I work for the Library of Congress. I think that's a very big advantage for someone who is a fledgling writer like myself. You work uh, for the Library of Congress? Yes, I do. Um, I, um, I spent eight years writing a novel that I think has turned out very well. I've spent about a year and a half trying to find a literary agent. A publisher, uh, a, a woman who is a published author, has told me, don't take it too seriously. The economy is in a shambles right now, and, and uh, the literary, uh, the, the publishing industry is suffering very badly. I'm just wondering if that's really true, if are things starting to look up again? Or um, this what? question's about the publishing industry right now, <clears throat> which happens to be something I know a lot about, because I've just been on a 30-city book tour, and my publisher reorganized while I was gone, so we had to find all the players when I got back. Um, everybody's really scared right now, and I don't understand why, because I think this is the best period, really. You know, people don't realize that when my first book came out 20 years ago, there were 40,000 new books, new titles every year. Now, there are 90,000 new titles every year. So it's a much easier time to publish a new book, but it's a much harder time to get your head above the water and have people know, notice you and know who you are. And I, I want to say this because I think probably a lot of people out here are aspiring writers, and you really need to know this. Um, and I, I've done this myself right now for this book because, as I said, my books, I've got 10 million or more copies of my books out in the streets uh, in, in 40 different countries, languages. I've got, I've, I've got as many countries and languages as David Baldacci. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing is, I still feel the need. It's like having a child. You've got to go out there. You don't just say, OK, kid, get out of the house and go get a job and support your mom. You know, you have to actually go out and support your book. And what I did this time, because when I came back from this lengthy book tour, which took something like seven months, because I had to go to France, Spain, everywhere else, um, and I found out that they'd reorganized. The people in charge of certain things, like my website, weren't in charge of it anymore. What I did was, I said, I had a big meeting. I went to New York. I said, I want everybody at the table. I'll write the check. You tell me what to do. And I literally, it's not that I had to spend a lot of money. I just didn't know what to do as an author, because I'd never done it. And when I started doing it, redesigning my website, we're still in the middle of it, and started uh, running little sponsorships here and there for NPR things and stuff. And, um, and going to festivals. As Jody said, a lot of us don't usually go to festivals. And that's where readers are, at festivals, you know? And my publisher never used to send authors to festivals. They wanted you in bookstores so you could sell the book immediately. And instead of talking to the readers and thanking the readers. So I think the biggest job of being either an aspiring author, I still think of myself as an aspiring author. <laughs> because um, I aspire to have my next book read by people. But I think the biggest thing to think of is a big part of the, of the uh, job is, has fallen on the shoulders of the author, which I think is where it should, should have been in the first place. Um, that's my big answer. But I, I can answer you more later if you want to see me afterwards. Yes, you had a question. Hi. A um, little bit nervous talking. My son's read The Eight and he's looking forward to reading The Fire. He just took it out of the library. Um, How old is he? He's 12. Oh, good. Perfect. And I, he's, he's interested in writing, and I wanted to ask you yeah. the connection between reading and writing. He's a great reader. 
um, what kind of books you read and when you knew you wanted to be a writer. Okay, when I started out, I hated the books. I was a really bad student, okay? I was the kind of student who wished, you know, we had those desks where the thing came up and folded over so you were like trapped like slaves in a galley ship. And I kept wishing that Walt Disney animals would sail their ship down and put the gangplank down outside my classroom window and take me off to Neverland or something. You know, and I loved, I hated the books we had to read. I didn't even like Tale of Two Cities because it took us two semesters to read it and we had to go over every single detail of, you know, physiognomy and whatever he's got in there. And, uh, and the books I liked to read were swashbuckling adventure novels, you know, I like Captain Blood and Raphael Sabatini and all that stuff. And um, so I'm going to say right now, I think that we owe more to one woman who got tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of children all over the world to read 700 page books. And not just to read them, yes, let's give her a hand. <laughs> not, not, not just, to, not just to read them, but they retain them. They know, I read, the Harry, I read all the Harry Potters. Uh, they know which one the giant spider is in, which one uh, is the prisoner of Azbekan, which one is the unicorn. And I think that's really important. So I, I'm a big supporter also of Virginia Center for the Book and Festival of the Book. And I was down there, yay! <laughs> we, we have to cheer everyone here that's selling books and sh getting people to read. And um, so I was down there last week for their kickoff meeting and I was talking to a gentleman who runs a school, a private school, where the emphasis is on writing. And he told me, I said, so what are they reading? And he told me, oh, they're reading Virginia Woolf, they're reading this, they're reading that, John Updike, whatever, very literary stuff, you know? And I said, oh, I, I can't read those books. Uh, I said, so what are the, what are the girls reading? What are the students reading? Um, do they, he said, well, I'm not sure. Uh, I said, do they read Stephanie Meyer? He said, Yes. <laughs> so uh, I said, you know, I, I think I feel I haven't read Stephanie Meyer's books yet, but I think as, just as uh, Jody and others were saying, you know, if it's something they love to read, it's going to inspire them to read and to write. And um, I don't think there. I'm not saying that any particular books are passe. I think we need all of the different kinds of books in the world, uh, but. Uh, if, if, a, if a child is a certain age, like nine or ten years old, and what lights their match, I, ha I have a little niece, and she was getting really bad grades in English, but she took me up to her room. I said, what are you reading? What do you like to read? And she recommended all these books, like the, girl, the woman who wrote The Princess Diaries and all those books. She's got every single book, and she's read them all. So yeah, I think it's, to, I would never have been a writer if I'd had to try to copy the style. Um, I loved Somerset Mom, but I couldn't copy his style, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for inspiration. What is Carl, my, I live with a famous brain scientist. He's always, what is it, one ounce of inspiration is worth 20 pounds of perspiration or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And come up and talk to me afterwards too, if you want. Do we have another one? No more questions? Oh my gosh, I'm ahead of time. Well, thank you guys very, very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.